terrific. The beginning of the end. Um, yes, it is. And it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. To an end, but we're coming, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And tomorrow morning is so significant because this is when we wrap up everything we've experienced and talk about our church and how we move forward. What has God done for you individually and what is God doing for our church? And so we know that we're in transition time with Pastor Olaf. Olaf leaving us we're sad about that but we know that he's being led by God to move on to the next level and we're talking about that tonight what does it mean to move to the next level so we as a church have to decide that too what does it mean for us and of course we'll have a new pastor coming in and so we want to be prepared we want to be prepared for who we are as a church and we need all of your input all of your dreams and ideas and what the spirit is doing in you to share with the whole body. You know what's impressed me the most? What? Is over the course of this 10 yeah. days yes. of prayer, yes. we had the lowest we've had is 59 people and the highest is 105. Well, so isn't that awesome? I mean, this That's, yes! We're really impressed that you come out the Holy Spirit yeah. has been working on your hearts, obviously. Amen. I can tell tonight we're going to be running around 80 by the list of things. Yes, we still have some chairs up front here. God has a yeah. plan for the regular church, and I think yeah. the Holy Spirit is moving, and yeah. we're doing some wonderful things going forward. Yeah. Tell us, Jane, what you want us to do here. And I'll start with us tonight. Okay. Uh, well, to start with, we have a question. What would you be willing to give up to go to the next level in work, or your favorite sport or your hobby. Sometimes to move forward, you have to let go. It's give up. Perhaps, yes. Yeah. What, what is the sacrifice to move ahead? Or, okay.
I'm right here. Test. Test. Okay. Let's get your attention back up here. And we'll move on with our program. Something's giving us some feedback. Just a second. Test. Testing one, two, three. Test, 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 okay. test. Okay, let's try that. Okay, so. I will. Yeah, well, and then I'll put, you want a song and then pray? You got something else? Because we're right here. Do something, let's sing, yeah. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all. So tonight we're going to be exploring the idea of the Holy Spirit or Holy Spirit-led sacrifice. Let us pray. Oh God, we love you and we thank you for how you've led us over this last 10 days. The enthusiasm and the fire of the Spirit that we see burning inside all those who have been coming night after night. And we praise you. And we want to ask, Father, that you'll continue this on into the future so that we might be uh, filled completely with your spirit and might be oriented towards your work here in Red Deer in a powerful way. And we ask these mercies. Uh, we ask a blessing also upon Pastor Don before he comes up and teaches tonight and all of those who are leading. And we ask these mercies in the name of Jesus. Amen. He is able. He is able. I know he is able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He is able. He is able. I know he is able. I know my Lord is able to carry me For our verse tonight, um, I was reading this afternoon from uh, James to 1 Peter, and I found these uh, two verses to share with you this um, afternoon. It is found in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. So if you are there, say yes. For me, this is a Thanksgiving um, verse, verses. I find this um, that we should be very thankful. Why? Here it is. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, 
you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Amen. Why I chose these verses is that some of us here are going through some pains and struggles in our life. And these verses is an admonition or is an encouragement for each one of us that we don't look in the present. We look for that exceeding joy that is going to be revealed to us by Christ. When we choose daily to look to Jesus, to that joy, that an eternal life that he has promised to each one of us, we are going to get there. Thank you. We're going to share in our groups now. Okay. Yeah. And it is uh, to invite you to share what God has done in your lives during this 10 days of prayer. So some of you who are new here tonight, or maybe we're at church this morning, maybe that's why you're here tonight. So God has moved you to come. So we're, we're praising the Lord for that. So take a few minutes and share what this journey has meant to you. Try it again now that you've heard it. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. My heart sings this song again. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Okay, ready? For our Scripture of praise, let's open our Bibles to Psalms 95 1. Psalms 95 1. It says here, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. 
Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Uh, it means when we have to praise God, we should praise Him with power, with our everything. Yeah, because He is our rock. Thank you, Mary. Okay, now in your small groups, uh, I want you to spend a moment praying with a partner. Uh, that the Holy Spirit would do what God's Word has promised in each heart. God said He would send His Spirit to those who ask. That's a promise. So we want you to pray about that, that God would do that here and now. Go ahead. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the verse that I would like to share about confession is found in Proverbs 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. I chose this verse um, because some of us may carry heavy burdens of guilt from the sins we have committed. God longs to give us rest from these burdens but he cannot do it unless we confess our sins. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to
How about the challenge? And I'm thinking about the challenge to today to go and break bread, you know, share a meal, invite somebody to your home or reach out to somebody. Did any of you enjoy that today? Did any of you try that? How did it go? Did it go okay? Good. Very good. I have some kids that have, have turned in some questions. And... Um, I was instructed that these must be read in front of all of you and answered in front of all of you. Don't you appreciate how kids are so direct? So I, I will do my best to answer these and if I can't answer them then, then I will defer to my, my family of God here. Amen? And I'll say, what do I do with this one? Because kids ask great questions. First one, and this is just to warm you up tonight because by the way, uh, we won't have time to answer every question that's here, but if you have some questions about what's happened this week, and it's really burning on your heart, some questions maybe is better handled just to come and talk to me or me and April together, or uh, that's fine, you know, afterwards or, or tomorrow morning when we come back. But uh, if it's something that you would like to have addressed, if we have time, we can, we can share it tonight. First one is, how old is the Bible? It's a great question. These are from... A bunch of our kids here. As Pastor Olaf and I were brainstorming together and thinking about that question, uh, you think about the writer of the first books of the Bible was Moses. And so we went back and, and thought through about when he started writing. And we're looking at about 3,400 years ago, roughly. 3,400 years ago, the Bible was started, started to be uh, written. What do you say to that? And what's awesome, I want to say to children here tonight, but also to adults, is even though this book is so old, that is so, the truth of it is so powerful even today. So I'm grateful. So that's the first one. Uh, the next one, what does God look like? It's a great question. And actually there's some places in the Bible that tell us a little bit about what especially Jesus looks like, Right? So we know that in the word it says his voice sounds like what? Thunder, yes, and also many waters or rushing waters, right? So that's something about not what he looks like, but what he sounds like. But then also, if you go to different places in prophecy, what else do we know about what he looks like? Give me some, raise your hand if you have some ideas. Way back here. Did he say feet like burnished bronze? Did I hear right? Yes, his feet are like burnished bronze. Amen. What else do we know from Scripture that God looks like? Right here. Eyes are like flames of fire. Yes. And that's not meant to be scary, but he's powerful. And sometimes we put him in a little tiny box, but he's a powerful living God. Anything else you know about what he looks like? Yes, what's his hair like? White like wool, right? So this is an amazing God, and we're going to have lots of surprises when we, when we see him. That's just a few things. And you can read more in Scripture. You'll find out even more about what he's like. What does heaven look like? Ah, this is a fun one. Oh, thank you very much. What does heaven look like? So thinking about Scripture right now, I want us to think together real, real quick. The streets are like gold. When you come up to it, it has how many gates on each side? On each side? Mm. Are there 12 gates on each side? Are there three gates on each side? Or is there one gate? Ooh, I'm encouraged. There's three gates on each side. Amen. And if I was coming up to the gates, I would see how many foundations coming up to the holy city. How many? Twelve of them, right? Now, if you took, 
If you wanted to know about how big is the city, the new Jerusalem in heaven, if you work with miles, sorry, but since I've come from the States, I still think miles. Is that okay? Will you forgive me? Okay, you'll still be my brothers and sisters? Okay, so I want you to imagine tonight, uh, help me out here because I'm still learning all my distances here in Canada. Um, what would be, and you translate in kilometers if you have to, but uh, about 375 miles is what I figure would be one side. Because do the math, 375 times 375 is 750. 750 multiplied again uh, by 2 is and you have, you're talking about how big the circumference is of the holy city. So what would be a city that would be somewhere around 375 miles from here? Just roughly, roughly, give you an idea of how big this city is. Do the math. What do you think? Is there anything significant uh, that distance right into BC? Or can we go into Saskatchewan to a significant city? What do you think? No, no, no. I'm saying what's from this, from right here in Red Deer, okay. if I went 375 miles any direction, would I land on some other significant place in Canada that you can think of? Okay. Just roughly, roughly. Do you think Regina could be that? Maybe? Is it possible? So just think for a second. What does this tell you about God's plans for heaven? It is, is there enough room for anybody who would choose to be there? Oh yes, one side, one wall of the New Jerusalem is 375 miles, roughly, long. That's a big, big city. It's a beautiful place. And one of the things fun for kids to think about, but also for us as adults, the lion and the lamb will, what? They will play together, right? They'll rest together. Uh, it says that the river coming out of the throne of God will have trees, one on one side, and then one on the other side of the river, and it'll meet, and how, what will be in those trees? Fruits for the healing of the nations. And there's much, much more. Okay. Well, this is a deep one. Pastor Don, what is your favorite color? Thank you to the kids. Green. I don't know if you call this green or not, but I like all colors of green. Okay. Uh, when did you have faith and how? And what happened when you found God? I will tell you one of the biggest factors for me in faith and finding God is my parents teaching me as a child, you need to read the Bible for yourself. Kids, are you listening, kids? If you want to have your own faith in God, start reading the Bible for yourself. Do not read it just to say, check, I've read it, but read it looking for Jesus because remember, as we had in the worship service today, Jesus said, these are the scriptures that testify about me, he said, or him, right? So kids, when you're reading scripture, look for what each chapter says about who Jesus Christ really is powerful thing. That's impacted my faith. But then there's another thing you can do. And tell me, adults and kids, if you agree with this. Your faith does not only come from the hearing of the word and the reading of the word, but it is doing what? It is walking by faith. Every time you take a step of faith, it strengthens your faith. Sometimes we are waiting for our faith to grow by sitting. It is not grow by sitting. It grows by reading the Word and acting on the Word. How many of you have a faith step you know God's calling you to do right now, you haven't done it yet? I'm not asking you what it is. I'm saying how many of you have a faith step that God's stretching your heart on, you know He's calling you to do it, but you haven't done it yet? Put your hands up. Don't be afraid. Okay? Good. Now the way you'll end up doing that is you read the Word of God and say, is this step of you? Is it secure in the Word of God? And if the answer is yes, then do what? Do Step out and do it and see the glory of the Lord. See His providence for you. That's how our faith grows. Okay? 
And finally, there are almost next to the last question is, and they said, and Pastor Don, you have to read this out loud. Please, please, please. Wow, this, this, this kid is really serious about this. P.S. Sorry, but how old are you? Oh, that does not bother Pastor Don to tell you. Because sometimes we as adults are embarrassed about how old we are. I've almost been killed so many times that I am so happy to be alive that I'm happy to say I'm 52 years old. Praise the Lord. So. And who, ah, no child has ever asked me this question in the whole world. Wow. This one I will defer to Pastor Olaf. Pastor Olaf, I'm going to put you on the spot. Kids, I want you to give your pastor a big hand because he's going to like this question. He really will. You will like it. You will like it. Come and help me. You can shoot me later, okay? But you will like this question. I'm serious. You didn't even warn me about this. No, I didn't. One of our children here, you can't even see it yet. One of, your, one of the children here says this question. <clears throat> now, get, loosen up. Get ready. Here. <laughs> Who baptized John the Baptist? Isn't that a beautiful question? Well, I'm so glad that the pastor is going to answer that one. Woo! I've never heard that question before. No, it's a good question. Uh, my mind is running through this. All right, so how long of an answer do you want? A short one. So no one is the short answer. Ah. The longer answer is this idea of baptism or immersion has existed in Judaism long before Christianity. It's called mikvah. It was being cleansed before one entered into the temple. You had to be completely purified and immersed. So this idea existed within Judaism long before John the Baptist. In fact, if you go to Jerusalem today, you can see where they had carved out these ponds, these, well, these, these bathing pools where people would get immersed before they went up to the temple. Ah. And so that, that exists, but baptism has, a, you know, has an, an added element to it, which is this, uh, this idea of you know, dying to sin, being mm -hmm. reborn, and uh, the experience of the Holy Spirit. So he probably had been immersed, many, immersed himself many times. Okay. But the idea of Christian baptism, I don't believe that John the Baptist was baptized in that sense. Mm -hmm. That's fair enough. Let's give him a hand. He was Thank the forerunner of Jesus. Yes. Right? Amen. Amen. And your pastor was just the right one to answer that one because he knows all the Hebrew backgrounds. Wasn't that beautiful? Thank you, pastor. Yes. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, like he's saying, yeah, might not have happened. Right. And the final one, because no adults have dared ask a question. So, do you like the play this morning? Do you like the play? Do I like what the kids did this morning? Like when they're impersonating? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, did you see what they did? Did you hear about it? You were one of the stars. <laughs> Amen? Uh, was there chocolate involved, he said. Yes. Didn't the kids do a good job? And by the way, I want us to give the children a hand for not only this morning the worship service, but in these 10 days, children and teens have been a voice in this revival. Let's give a big hand to what Jesus has done to them. Amen. Now, if you have any other questions, adults, young people too, write them down. If I can, I'll cover them tonight and also tomorrow morning. Now invite us right now. This is a, a powerful moment in your groups before we go to the Word of God. We really haven't prayed yet tonight that God would totally mm, humble ourselves to receive whatever He wants to give. We haven't really prayed that yet, right? Right? Can we do that just for a moment, just, just for another moment? Can we get on our knees and say, God, whatever you need to do in my heart so that I can experience what your Holy Spirit wants to do, would you have your way with me? Because we're ending this tonight as far as evening meetings tonight, and it's on the sacrifice. We cannot sacrifice for the Lord Jesus without him doing his work first in us. So I invite you to get on your knees with your group and let's humble ourselves just for a, a couple minutes. And you can pray out loud if you want to. 
Now, just short prayers in the groups, please. Okay, tonight I invite you, uh, well, first of all, Tony, I'm going to give, where's Tony, where is he right here? I hey, just saw, you just brought me a question. Uh, I will answer his question uh, just in a little bit here, but I'm going to give, so just hold on. But I want to invite us right now to go into the Word of God. Please open your Bibles to Acts, Acts chapter 4. So please turn with me in your Bibles or on your phone to Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, the passage is 32 through 37. Acts 4, 32 through 37. Tell me when you're there. Okay. I would invite you to read that out loud in your groups. This again is painting a powerful picture of what church used to be like, right? Almost 2,000 years ago, what church used to be like. Dangerous question tonight. When you read that tonight, how, well, what was it like, first of all, 2,000 years ago, based on that passage? What was it like? And how does that compare with today? Are you with me? So what was it like? What kind of painting of the picture of the church do you find 
in this passage. What was it like 2,000 years ago based on that passage? And how does it compare with church today? And I'm talking about this church. Let's don't be general. This Red Deer Church. Is that fair enough? Can we be real? So I'm going to give you a few minutes. Please open the Word of God and go for it. And, have, and small group leaders lead them in that discussion. Thank you so much. And now that was our highest. Did you begin on the Sabbath and then on Friday? What's happening? Yeah, like 70 years. 70 years. And we joined her in five last time. And then we're in her 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 Okay, everybody, if you're ready, clap once. Now I'd like to ask, if your group wants to send me an ambassador to share just one trait, one characteristic of the early church based on this passage, then come right up here. Remember, my first question is, what was the early church like based on this picture? in the end of chapter four. 
I'd rather have you come up here. We can hear each other better. So I need, uh, if you want to send, we don't need to have to have every group send, but uh, well, let's have quite a few groups. Send me somebody. And I want you to each to just give one thing, okay? One thing from the early church, okay? Come on up. Give me a few more. That's good. Okay? One thing that the early church was like. Like, what was it like 2,000 years ago? Okay? Are you ready to hear? Shh. I'm going to start with the youngest. Um, so, um, get, okay, so our group discussed this. We said um, that the church back then was more, more charitable because they sold everything they had, their land, their possession. And, uh, and even though like they, didn't, um, like they didn't have much, but they still did it for the glory of God. Amen. Thank you very much. Right on target. Thank you so much. Keep on coming. So we think that the church back then, they are reunited in God's faith. And um, they, you know, they were willing to sacrifice everything for God's work and mission. So united to sacrifice, yeah. right? Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Keep on coming. We, we're not ignoring you, okay? This is coming. But yeah, no. I would have to agree with what uh, they said. Uh, with one heart and one soul, they sold everything, very selfless gestures. And I think they fulfilled uh, what the scripture says that uh, Christ said, carry each other's burden. And by this, you'll know that the law of Christ is fulfilled. So they, it's very literal in that church. So, that's so Very good. Now we'll go back here just to keep you on your toes so you don't fall asleep. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I see most of what we discuss as a group were uh, replicate there, but um, of course we see selflessness. Just one. Yes, sacrifice, and um, there's a there's a thought that just slipped me there. Very important, but it slipped me just now. Go ahead. I understand. As we get older, brother, it happens to people like me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right back here. Um, our group spoke about uh, we zoomed in on the selfless part where like they met everybody's need so like everybody's need one met not just one person will get the bigger share and like they were charitable yes but then everybody who was there according to their need they were received you know so like um they were more of a community service church yes wow amen thank you uh let's see we, we have to do ladies first okay sorry quasi okay so so that church back then was actually suffering persecution. Having left the main uh, church religion of state, um, they, they were cut off. They were considered unclean. They were separated out in the community. They didn't have the natural business relations anymore because they were persona non grata in their own towns, right? And so what did they do? They supported each other. They helped each other. Beautiful. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you consider the uh, kind of investment that is disposed of, like houses and then the land, these are very huge, huge investments that they decide to, you know, sell and then give everything to the work of God. So you see that they have the zeal to work for God. Amen. Thank you. And our last one. Um, yes, um, the text saying also that um, they were selfless, that's one point, and um, God gave them a benefit. The benefit in the text is that the grace of God was upon them. So, in order for us to, to receive God's grace as a church, we must be united, we must be selfless, and also we must have one heart and one mind. Sometimes in the church we have discussion and people are pulling here and there. But we need to come at one mind, one song mind, in order to receive the benefit that God has for us. So in order for Red, Red Deer to be, you know, unite, I mean, to be effective in God's kingdom, we need to be united and also so that God's grace may fall upon us and we can see it impact in the lives of the members and in the community in which we live. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Short thought. Short thought. Short thought. It was trust. Trust. Trust was there, and that was the factor that I wanted to share because they, they sold their position, bring it to the church, and at the leader's feet, 
So there was a, a high level of trust in the leaders of the church, and that's something that we have to pay attention to, that we need to replicate in our trust. time. Okay. Amen. Okay, last one. <laughs> as you just said, they also acted on, on, on their faith. Yes. So as the Lord put on their heart, they went for it Amen. right away. Amen. Good. Now the dangerous question, right? It's nice and comfy to say, oh, that's so beautiful that 2,000 years ago, church was like that. But I asked you another part of the question. Did you even have a chance to get to it? Like, how does it compare with today? Now, when we do that, there's an important thing that we need to make as a ground rule as we take a few minutes to discuss this tonight. We must talk about what the church is today by using the word us or we need not you need you need you know what i'm saying no really it changes our attitude because i am laodicea are you we are laodicea i can't get around the fact that in the word of god the last people waiting for jesus to come are called laodicea we live now in the time of laodicea we desperately need revival now send me up now look at your group, small group leader. Send me up somebody else from your group who will say, what are you convicted in your group that we need in this church? When you see the description 2,000 years ago, you see what church used to be. What is the Holy Spirit saying in this church tonight about what we need to be in the Red Deer Church now in the end of time? Are you with me? So I'm going to give you one minute. Discuss together who's going to send up and send me one person. You're going to have short, short answers, like a one-sentence answers. Okay, those groups who want to send me an ambassador, send me an ambassador. Thank you. Here's my first ambassador. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Good to have some young people here. <clears throat> so uh, I'll take from this side. I'll keep on uh, having you come up. Come on up. Now, <clears throat> ground rules. Share as close to only one sentence as possible. So we have a short, so we have many people. If you start preaching, I'll say, thank you so much, brother and sister. Thank you so much. And enjoy your seat, please. Okay? Can we do that together? Is that fine? I won't offend you? Okay. So starting out, um, remember the question is, what? What are we convicted that we, what's our need in the Red Deer Church right here, right? so that we can be like what the Holy Spirit did in the church 2,000 years ago. Amen? What's your answer? Answer one. Let's listen. By the way, listen very deeply. Shh. Because I want to see with you, does the Spirit of God bring out any themes tonight from these brothers and sisters? Because they haven't compared answers, right? Right? So let's see if the Spirit of God does anything. I don't know what's going to happen in the next few moments. But I want to see, does the Spirit of God make this a teaching moment? for us right here. Amen? Point number one. Um, so, the, nowadays we're like, 
we're afraid of going out and speaking to people because we feel like we're gonna get a judge or like back then people didn't care if they got offended nowadays even if you offend somebody like a little bit like they're gonna be rude to you for like a whole year and um, so I feel like we need to be able to speak f full of the Holy Spirit even when we feel like we're gonna offend somebody because the truth has like the truth has to be spread around the world and yeah that's amen it. so help me out one second before you sit down thank you this is a very powerful comment so now we're going to bring it together in one thing say we need what we need to be bold to be bold for jesus amen give her a hand thank you so much okay what else do you what else does your group feel we need right now uh i think we back in the day Whatever we could give, they would give, but we don't all give that much nowadays. Mm, we need to give like they give. Amen. Give her a hand. Thank you so much. And by the way, don't change your answers because we're looking for themes, right? Right? So it's okay if you give the same answer. We want to see what the Spirit of God may be saying to us in this room. What else? What do we need? I feel like we need more involvement in mission trips and being missionaries. Like back in the day, apostles or people in church, they always like discipled mm -hmm. to other people around um, Europe and for, at that time and to the world eventually. So. Amen. So we need to be more involved in missionaries, right? Missionaries. To be missionaries. Yeah. Amen. Give them a hand. Thank you so much. What else do we need? More unity. Unity, unity in the church. We need to be have a more unified uh, focus. Amen. Okay. <laughs> unity in the church. Give her a hand. Thank you so much. Come on up. Our group uh, say that we need family unit. That's what we are missing. Because with these meetings for 10 days, I think we've come closer to each other, know each other more, and then that's the way you can even know people's needs so that you can manage to help. So family, more you renew, um, uh, revival and reformation. Okay. Amen. Thank you so much. Give her a hand. Come on up. I think we uh, need to start uh, walking the talk. We need to walk the talk. Walk the talk. Yeah. We're like a, a team of uh, players, and the world is our audience. Every week, we do our game plan, but all, in six days, we don't do our game plan, yeah. and the world is not impressed. Wow. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know what? That one uh, cuts my heart as a follower of Jesus. Does that cut your heart? And is it true of us? Of us. If we really lived out the faith of Jesus Christ, non-believers in this town would take note that we have been with Jesus. And they would say, what's this power in your life that we don't have as a non-believer? We need to know your God. But this doesn't happen as often as it should, right? Because we're not really living out our faith. We believe, but we don't live it, necessarily. Amen. Next one. What's on your heart? We uh, need? Uh, we need uh, sacrifices to, uh, to be with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the unity of the church comes with it uh, when, when you're willing to give sacrifices, sacrifice yourself and, and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Give him a hand. Amen. We need sacrifices. Coming over here on this side. What do we need? Uh, we are a multicultural church right now. Uh, we need one heart. We need one purpose into the community. Amen. 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 Yeah, in our group, we saw that uh, a church in Radia needs to kneel down and pray for the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy, we, be, because without the Holy Spirit, we can't reach the, those people of uh, all the times that church, they became so because of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Before that they were hiding, they couldn't go out and witness, but after the Holy Spirit they were animated and witnessed about the, the, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the, the Holy Spirit gave them the power to become one, one soul, one heart, sharing their things. And they, one thing, they invited even other people as we read, there was one person called Barnabas. They accepted his things, so we had to do the same. Mm. Amen. Thank you. Give her a hand. Thank you. Come on up. 
Uh, we settle on uh, unity, trust, and obedience to the word of God. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, our team uh, just concluded that we need a unity and a trust as well as a boldly to overcome the needs of the, our church members and ask the Holy Spirit what this, need, this church need to go that one, that we need to ask the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Finally, Eric. Um, our group focused more on, um, as a church, we need faith and we need to be um, unselfish. So stop focusing on ourselves and start focusing on others as well. Amen. Praise God. Good. Now, hmm. because this revival is not a program, do you understand that? It is actually calling, we are here together during these 10 days to re have the Holy Spirit recalibrate us. Amen? to actually make revival a, a lifestyle in our lives every day, then we don't have this neat, tidy thing to do next that's on the program. But we have just heard some powerful things that we have just said in this room of what we need. And did you hear some themes? Did you hear some themes come up again and again? Now, yes. Unity. Is that, did that come up the most times? Unity came up a lot. What else came up? Selflessness came up a lot. Being bold, more faith-filled, right? These are some of the general themes. Am I right? Okay. Unity came up a lot. Hmm. Um, can I have an illustration? Uh, I need some people to stand by me who don't look like me. Okay? Amen. Okay. Now, isn't it interesting that the kids came up? Are you saying that I'm a very old person? Because they're saying, I said, who will come that doesn't look like me? And all the kids come. They're saying, this guy is over the hill. So, so thank you. Now, let's do something in illustration. By the way, praise God for you guys. I love it that you're part of this revival. Praise the Lord. Yeah, come on up. Come on up. Now, here's the danger we have in the church today. I'm going to see how you can help me with this. I need everybody, ah, uh, let's see how we can best do this. Our first illustration is going to be this way. I'm going to put this down. Uh, we're going to make a circle. We're going to make a circle right here. Help me out. But we're all going to face out. Okay? So make a circle with me. We're all going to face outward, all the way around. So you turn them that way. Turning. Everybody faces out. Okay, are we doing that now? Now, let's make a circle. This is kind of a circle. It's an interesting circle. Okay, good. Now, are we all facing out? Now, we are so much. Change of the mother and kids. See what she's doing? We're all facing out. Are we? Are we? Are we together? Are we together? Yes. We are all doing. Got the right idea, but not yet. Okay? This is who we are in North America. We are very much our own individual. Am I right? We like to do our own thing. We do not know much in North America about how to actually be a unified family of God when we look so different from each other. Right? But could this be our greatest strength in North America? Could it be our greatest strength right here in the Red Deer Church? that God would trust this church with people from all over the world in an unusual way to me, precious way. Is it possible that it, it could be even intentional from heaven that this church could represent even the world church for some purpose that we don't even know yet? Is that possible? So kids, what should we be looking like? We're now we're facing away from each other. You help me out. What should, don't tell them yet. Let's let them work on this. What should we do to show we're unified? Look at so each you other. help me out. We look at each other. So I'm looking at you. Hold on, hold on a second. I'm looking at you. Does that, does that mean I'm unified with you? Hold hands. Hold hands. Is that better? 
Okay? Okay? Now is this better? Yes. Uh, what do you think? Is this better? Yes. Uh, and maybe, are we still a little too far apart? What if we come in a little bit closer? A little bit closer? Oh, that's good. We don't want to step on each other. Hold on, brother. But this is what we need to do. We need to come close together and be on one team. And we also need to do something else, kids. We can't just be together. What's the, who's the one that brings us really close together? Jesus. Let's all point to Jesus. What would happen? What would happen if out here, look with me out here. What would happen if all of us tonight would get together with people that we don't normally pray with, that look different from us, right? And we say, brother, sister, will you get on your knees with me? Will you pray with me like we have not prayed before in the Red Deer Church? And would we cry out to God tonight to unify us according to the Spirit of God? And that He would move on our hearts tonight. Can we do that for a few minutes? But can we not just fix somebody we know and say, oh, I'm going to go over here and I know this brother's life is going to pray with him because I already know him. What if we instead do a messy thing tonight? What if we pause and say, God, Move, your Holy Spirit long for me to connect with this church that I am separated from. Cannot connect with. Lead me by your Spirit tonight to pray with one or two others. We'll probably be three, maybe a three, you know? Team up with somebody that's not who you pray with. Get on our knees, humble ourselves, and cry out to God tonight to pour out His Spirit on us, to unite us together. And by the way, pray right now that God prepares us for tomorrow morning. If you do not come tomorrow morning, I will tell you, the easy thing for this church to do is say, thank you, Lord, it's in the Bible. Let's go back to the way it's always been. Tomorrow morning is a dangerous morning against the kingdom of Satan. It's a morning where out of this prayer, we come together in the name of Jesus and say, what is next on your heart, God? We are seeking you, and we're actually going to be putting together what comes up from you, young and old, that we can share back with the leadership of this church and the new pastor coming and say, this is where the Spirit of God is already moving. What do you say? So I invite you right now, in two, or let's put this in three, in three, go find someone the Spirit of God is pressing you to pray with, and let's get on our knees and really pray right now.
All right, if you can find a seat. Amen? Is God doing a, a special work in this church? Yes. yes, He is. Please find a seat. Okay. Jason, by the way, right here, uh, helped us with some research. Thank you. If you can just put him right here. And he just found out that 375 miles away from Red Deer is a little town called Lolo, Montana. And that's 375 miles. It's just one side of the New Jerusalem from here to Lolo, Montana. What do you say? That's how big our Heavenly Father's plans are for His people. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jason, for that. Appreciate that. Now, a few things. Are you still okay? You okay? How do we know the Bible is real? Now, shh. This comes from you, right here. A couple of things. But you know what? Actually, because we're the body of Christ, how do you know the Bible is real? Very short answers, one sentence answers. Raise your hand if you've got an answer to this, because this is an opportunity for you as a body of Christ to actually be used of the Spirit to answer a question from a fellow believer. How do you know the Bible is real? Quick, quick answers, short answers. Okay. So, when you read the Bible, you see nature tells you everything that the Bible says is true. Okay, you see nature and it tells the Bible is true. Okay, I need just short answers. Is that short? One way in the back? It convicts our souls. It convicts our souls, so you know it's true. Yes. Right here? You read it. Yes, you need to read it and see it's true. Right? Looking anywhere? Right here? 
Archaeological evidence shows that it's real. Give me another one. Personal experience can show you that it's real. Yes? Pardon me? Our breath? Yes, thank you. Amen? I'm sorry? Health message testifies. Okay, did you hear that one? The health message itself, from the Bible, he was saying, if you follow it, it shows the Bible is a true testimony because it works. Right? Okay, give me a few more. Prophecies fulfilled is a huge evidence for, the, for Scripture. Yes? And it says, the, the heavens and earth will pass away, but the Word of God stands forever. Way in the back. Thank you. Amen. Amen. I'll take two more. Right here. Yes. Yes. Amen. And right here. No. One last one. If it's not true, the devil wouldn't want to get rid of it. And the devil has tried very hard to eradicate the Bible and it still exists. Praise the Lord for that. Another one. How do we know what God calls us to be? How do we know what God calls us to be? Ooh, how many of you know what God is calling you to be right now? Raise your hand if you know why God birthed you into this world to live now. Okay, one or two hands. Most hands, three, four hands. I want to tell you something. If this church had enough people, and enough people is any people, but if you want to know in this church why God called you into existence now, and not in the Middle Ages, not in the time of Moses, why He actually called you as children and teenagers and adults and older adults to live now, let me know. Because one of my God-given callings from God is to help people find their God-given dream. I don't have the wisdom for what you're called to be, but I know in the Word of God there's some processes that can be known and that can help you have it out with your Heavenly Father. And you can know right now in this time in your life why God called you in existence. You can have a holy purpose for what you're doing. You don't need to be just doing jobs in the end time. We need to be living out ministry in whatever we do. Everything you do, computer programmer, working in the restaurant, having your own business, a million other one things. You need to know, I need to know, how we can live our holy purpose now. Amen? If you're interested in that, let me know. How do we know what God calls us to be? We got that one? Why does it feel like God is not with us when we need Him? Why does it feel like God is not with us when we need Him? This is an opportunity for someone else right here in the body of Christ to stand up and be counted. If you've had a time where you felt like God was not there, and you can bring it down to answer it so that our kids can even hear your story, if you have a short story of a time when you thought God was not there for you, but then you realize looking back that he was. It's a testimony moment right now for young and old in this room right now. Come up. You're the first one I see. Okay? Short story. Okay? Tell me about that story. Um, in Sabbath school, we were studying uh, about God's presence in our lives and how when we face trials... And so somebody answered to one of the questions. She said that in a classroom, the teacher teaches. And after, the, after he or she teaches for a certain amount of time, there's going to be a time for exam or test. But before, prior to the test, the teacher was giving answers and explaining things. 
But on a day, you have to take the test. The teacher cannot provide the answers at that moment. And she said, it's the same thing with us. God trains us and teaches us every day. But when the trials come, we have to answer. And so that's the answer we had uh, for that. Mm -hmm. It's not that God does not answer, but he knows that you're prepared for the moment. He's been preparing you for it. Mm -hmm. So whatever you and I are going through, we already know the answer. We just have to make it manifest. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Is there someone right here? Are you raising your hand? Is there someone right here? And I want a one-minute story. One-minute story. One-minute story of when God did not, you didn't think God was there, and you know later he was. Okay? Yeah. In my life, uh, you have I, to hold the microphone up. in my life, I got a hard time where my kids were to sleep without food. My husband had, had no job. And even at the office, I was not given enough time to, to do the things. I could get more money from my salary, and my salary was very low. Then I started keeping praying. I every day walk uh, at uh, I think 2 o'clock at night, knelt down, praying and praying, crying to God. And then I, I finish praying. I, see, I look at the clock. It was already 6 o'clock. Then I prepare myself, go to work. I, I did that for four months, but no answer. Mm. Then I said, maybe God is not listening to me. Then I remembered one song I was taught by a Philippine sister. It was said, if tragedy will be my share and all my things be overcome, I will still love you, my God, and say, you are will be done. I had been continuing singing, so then things started to change. Fortunately, my, my husband got something to do. My salary raised. And then I was able to keep my kids. So at that time, I thought God was not with me. But I think God has good plans. He always answers you at the time he thinks is proper. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Now, tonight, one of you asked, so what brings us together? Are you hungry for that answer or not? Like, what really brings us together? So... If you have something, maybe go on your phones right now. You can take these down and you can help me out. You might want to add to my list, but this is what comes to my heart tonight. Okay? First of all, who is the one who brings us together? So, who in particular? Yes. And the focus is got to be Jesus Christ. So, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. If this church wants to be even more together then who must be lifted up? Jesus Christ, not particular groups in this church, but Jesus must be lifted up higher and higher and higher. He said, when I am lifted up, I will draw some people to me, all people to him. So this is, this has to, he has to be the focus. Now, bear with me really, really fast. I'm going to go super, super fast. So what about, what do we know from this book of Acts about coming together? Several, several things. The early church what did they do? Their focus was on Jesus. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, right? When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is someone who binds us together. And yet most Seventh-day Adventists do not pray for this gift every day. And we wonder why we have no unity in our marriages, no unity in our homes, no unity in the church. Could it be that most of us are not crying out to God on a daily basis, pour out your spirit upon me. Change my heart, O oh God, and give me the heart of Jesus. Would this church change if every child, every teenager, every young adult right here tonight, every older adult would cry out to God for the Holy Spirit, humbling themselves? Do you think it would make a difference? Yes, yes but most churches will not because we're too busy to do such a thing. We're too comfortable about our routine already, and we already have a certain level of success, right? And so we don't. Next thing. So they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They also broke bread together. Broke bread together. Am I right? Is that right? They broke bread together, meaning they were much more into what we did today 
than what we are doing usually. Now, I want to say something. Now, can, can I just share from my heart? I'm just sharing as your brother. I'm just sharing just bold. Um, you can have a potluck in this church every Sabbath, and I don't know if you do or not. Is it every Sabbath or not? Okay, once a month, what? You can have it twice a month. There's some churches we go to, it's every Sabbath. You can have a potluck every Sabbath and still not be unified. You can have a potluck every single Sabbath, a beautiful potluck, where you all come together and not be together. In the book of Acts, they broke bread together somewhere in the home. And there's something about going into each other's homes where all of a sudden we realize, ah, you're my sister. Ah, you're my brother. Ah, you're my brother. You know what I'm saying? And we all of a sudden realize we're not just church members to sit next to each other in church and go, uh-huh, amen. We are family. But you don't get that feeling until we start going and going out of our comfort zones and saying, come on over, brother. Come on over, sister. And likewise, and you invite me to come to your home and to, to break bread together and to pray together. Pray together. These are huge elements about being unified. Focuses on Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, breaking bread together, praying together, and they were on mission together. Without, a, without mission, a big enough mission for the Red Deer Church, you'll have no reason to come together. There must be a purpose for this church that's bigger than any one interest group in this church. Something so, so big that it's impossible to do without the intervention of God. Why do I know this? The last church I was, I was in, God humbled my heart and talked to me about how he wants to unify a people. I had many people, right April, we had many people without jobs in our last church in California. It was not a wealthy church. It was a hard place for many families. Many, many families wrestle. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a part of the United States that has a high uh, joblessness. Fresno, California, you can check it out later. You've heard of Fresno, California, bad place for jobs. So don't go there unless God called you. <laughs> in that setting, one uh, day... I came back from a mission trip with a need, but let me back up. When I was in Zimbabwe by Seleucy, Seleucy College, um, I went there one night. Do you have time for a story? Right. This is the last story of the night. Okay? Is that all right or not? Right. Children, are you okay or are you too tired? In at Seleucy, when the stars were out, uh, I was all finished training for that division for several weeks. I was tired. And the chaplain said, come and speak to our young people a couple hours away in Seleucy. And I was supposed to go and, and look at the wild animals the next day because I love outdoors. They wanted to take me out and, to, and have a day off. And I was like, yes, I'm ready for a day off. And here this chaplain said, uh, Pastor Dunn, we have nearly a thousand children and you came a year ago and spoke out by the fire. Will you come and speak to our, our children? And how do you weigh that? A day off, which I needed, but a thousand children waiting to have Jesus lifted up. And so I, I, I prayed very short. I said, God, what should I do? And he said, go. I said, okay, I'm going. It's about that long of a decision. I said, I'm coming. So I went that night, and um, the children were waiting, and they were singing for two hours, waiting to come. Such hunger for Jesus. And then finally, I said goodnight to all the kids, and I said, uh, where am I staying? They said, well, we don't know. We weren't expecting you at Seleucy. I said, oh. And I was thinking about the hyenas and, the, and everything else out there, and I said, you do have a place for me to, to stay tonight. We'll find you a place. So they took me out, out, up against a, 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 a dormitory where the older students go, because of course I'm older. Kids, I'm older. So they took me to the older student place, and, the, and about a stone's throw away is a high fence that keeps, keeps the leopards out most of the time. And that's where they decided to put me. I thought, oh, nice, nice. I heard strange noises as they took me up there. I said, oh, I'm so, I said, that, that fence really works, right? And they said, oh, yes, pastor, don't worry, don't worry. 
And so I said, okay, great. I said, where to go? They said, here is your key. They gave me a key, a skeleton key. How many of you have seen a skeleton key? Do you know what a skeleton key is tonight? Do any of you know? No one knows. You know. It's an old-timey key. It's a metal key, and it has a strange um, pattern on the end of it. It's hard to even describe, but it's a strange, long metal key. And they said, here is to get into your room. Thank you very much. So I said, good night. And I put in that skeleton key and turned it once, and I went in, no problem. And I said, good night. And I went down on my knees after getting ready for bed, and I said, God, I said, I'm not supposed to be on this campus originally. I was supposed to be in a game park. But for some reason, you have me here. I spoke to the children, but I'm here for 24 more hours. Is there something else you have on your heart? Why would you put me here tonight? We must be asking God more and more and more, why did you put me here today? Right where we are, in our business, in our home, in this church in Red Deer, we need to ask, why are we here? And I asked, and God said a strange thing that night. He said, come out under the stars. There's something I have to tell you. It was not an audible voice. God speaks to my mind and to my heart, which he does so many times down through the centuries for God's people. God does not speak to us in this room because we are so special more than anyone else he speaks to people who are listening I've spent many many years not listening being busy I'm trying to learn to listen just being real with you are you trying to learn to listen to that still small voice I'm trying to learn slow down and listen hard lesson for this guy to learn so I go out under the stars the stars are almost like you could just grab them out of the sky how many of you have been in Zimbabwe and seen the stars. Am I telling the truth? You can almost go like this, right? You can just go almost grab it, right? I mean, it's so bright. And I was there and I said, oh, this is a good place to talk to Jesus. So I went on my knees in the tall grass around me and I'm listening to, with my eyes big, right across about that far away to that wall, I heard the sounds of big animals on the other side. And I said, oh God, I'm glad you're big. Why did you call me out here? I'm gonna pray real fast and run back inside. So I'm praying, and I said, you told me to come out here. What's on your mind? What's on your heart? No, oh, I'm telling you. I mean, okay, you can laugh, but you know. Hey, hey, most of those leopards have not seen someone that looks like me, so they might find me interesting. So it's dangerous. Okay, it's dangerous for me. So I'm praying, and God says, ask me one question. I said, what do you want me to ask you? Or one thing. And God says to me a strange thing. He says, ask me to do much more for Africa. I thought, why does God need me to ask him to do much more? Now think about this. What an interesting thing to, for God to say. But God wants us to ask him to do more so he can show us his glory and his power. God is waiting for us in this room to ask him to do much, much more for this church, for this city, for our family, and for the country that we represent besides this country. Amen? So I think... I'm looking around, no one's listening. I say, I feel a little bit funny because, huh, why does he want me to ask that? So I sit in the darkness beside Seleucy in the high grass. So God, do much more. I'm asking you, do much, much more for Africa. I cry out to you in the powerful name of Jesus. Do it. And then I waited. And I said, was I supposed to say something else? And I waited. Closed my eyes, still hearing the strange animal sounds. And I felt peaceful. Just peaceful, like that's what I needed to ask. So I went back to my room, took out my skeleton key, and I said, oh, now I can finally sleep. And I slapped it right in there and turned it, and it would not open. Huh. And I tried it five times, 10 times, 15 times. If you know what a skeleton key is, it is not like a magnetic card. There's no complications to it. There's no mechanical issues. It's a simple kind of old-timey key. It just clicks, and it opens. 15 times it doesn't open. I'm getting frustrated. Okay, because I need more of the Holy Spirit. I'm getting frustrated. <laughs> and I'm turning and twisting and saying, God, have mercy on me. I am so tired. I have been preaching and teaching all day long and traveling to Seleucy. And why can't I get in? And the still, small voice of God says, you're not getting in because you just cried out to me to do much more for Africa. And there's somebody you must see tonight in this place. That's why you can't get in yet. Ooh. Now I'm looking around, and now the dorm lights are all out. And I'm thinking, uh, God, 
quick answer, everybody's asleep. So can I get in? No. There's somebody you need to see. But Lord, they're all asleep in here. So I mean, I, all the lights are out. There's somebody you need to see. Well, okay, God, because I can't get in, I'll go. So I start down the long hallway. It's all dark, dark, dark as the inside of a cow. You know, it's dark, okay? So I'm going along, and I'm thinking, ah, who am I supposed to see? Lord, the, everybody's studying for their exams the next day. I don't want to just walk up on a door and scare them half to death. They open the door, and they see a white face in the darkness. They don't know I'm here, and they say, ah, they think I'm a ghost or something. And so I said, Lord, can, I, can you give me a different assignment? This is a silly assignment for me. I'm going to scare someone to death. Okay, Lord. So I'm going, holding this key. I said, I'm going to make a fool of myself. Okay, Lord, they're all asleep. And then there's light coming out from one door in a long hallway. You know, those are big dormitories. Long hallway. Only one door with light coming out and a little bit of Christian music playing. This is late at night. I said, okay, I'm just going to tap on the door, just really, really soft. And then I, 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 Lord, help me not to scare him too bad. So I just tap like this, just really soft. The door flings open. And a man pushes his face like this, and he sees my white face, and he goes, Whoa! He said, hey, what are you doing here? I said, I'm not a robber. I promise, I promise, I'm here for the Lord Jesus. And I said, I can't get into my room. He said, you poor brother. He said, I am the education director for Northern Zambia. And he said, brother, give me your key. He said, I've been going to school here for a long time in the summers, working on my master's. This is easy to get in. He said, follow me. I said, yes, brother. So I go like this. And we go up to the door. He puts it right in the lock. He turns it, and guess what happens? No, it does not. It does not open. And he says, oh, this is strange. This has never happened to me in all the years I've come here to study. He said, I've even stayed in this room before. I said, well, try it again. Maybe you know something I don't know. He tries it five times, ten times, fifteen times. It does not open. He says, hmm. And he says, excuse me, one second, Pastor. It's okay. He said, we'll get you into this room. He gets this tall, tall, young student who's a night watchman who makes me look like a very tiny man. He's a big giant of a man. He says, Pastor Don, he said, give me your key. I will get you in your door. No problem. I said, ah, please do. Kind sir. And so he takes my key, and he goes, and he's a big guy. His arms are like this, like this, and he just goes like this, and he's doing everything he can do, and he's bracing up against it and everything. He's starting to sweat, and it's a cold night in Africa. It's a cold part of the, of the, of the year, and he's starting to sweat. And he says, ah, I have never had this happen before. I cannot get in this door. He said, I will wake up the dean. I said, oh, no. And he goes and wakes up the dean. The dean comes with a whole basket of keys. I have many keys that work in this lock. No problem. I said, oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Please have at it. And he tries them one by one. All the ones with my number on it. And none of them work. God, I know this is supposed to be funny, but it's not funny anymore. Lord Jesus, it's almost midnight. I need to sleep. Why are you doing this? And the still small voice of God said, the man who you got out of his room from Zambia, you need to ask him a question. Okay, what do you want me to ask him? I, this is all in my mind between me and God. And he's standing there, he's just watching. We're watching the dean as he's trying all these keys. Everybody's frustrated. He says, ask this man, what do you need and how can I help you? I said, now Lord, you know that I have only a few dollars in my pocket. Lord, you know that if I say, what do you need and how can I help you? He might ask me something so big, he might say, like, can you put my three children through school in Seleucy? And then I'll have to have the sad thing and say, brother, here is my, I think I had less than $100 U.S. for emergency money. This is what I have. I said, God, that's, this will not help three kids to go through. That's probably what he's going to say. The Holy Spirit said the second time, ask him, what do you need, brother? How can I help you? Third time, the Spirit of God says, and so finally I go, <clears throat> brother, what do you need? The Spirit of God has impressed me to ask you, what do you need? How can I help you? 
And he gets a big smile. And I thought, oh, Lord, I knew he was going to be too happy with this question. <laughs> okay. And he says, oh, pastor, I'm so happy you asked me this question. Hand me this key, he says to the dean. And the dean's been working back with my key all this time for 30 minutes. And the dean says, here's his key. And the pastor from Zambia, he puts it in the lock. And he turns it once. And the door opens. This has never happened before in my life. And I said, everybody was like, their eyes were all big. And we had a moment there where we knew that the Spirit of God was up to something. Remember, he told me this was all, all this happened just so I could find someone that I would never, ever cross paths with before. And so I thanked everybody for helping me. And I said, Pastor, I don't know you. Please come down and get on your knees with me in my room. And let's cry out to God and say, why did you arrange this tonight? And we did. We got up from our knees. What do you need? I said. And I said, oh boy, Lord, help me be ready. When he says he has maybe five kids who need school. Okay, brother, go ahead. Tell me. What do you need? How can I help you? <clears throat> How can I help you? And he says, well, in North Zambia... We have no Seventh-day Adventist schools. And I got a little bit nervous. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, so, so what do you need? So, we need a Seventh-day Adventist school up by Kasama. Any of you know where Kasama is? In way up North Zambia. He said, we need a school there. We have no Seventh-day Adventist school there. And I was just, uh, it just was starting to reel with that. I said, uh, that, uh, you mean like a, little, like a little elementary school? Like a one-room school? I'm saying, yes, Lord. <laughs> that would be big, but maybe we can have a little school. He said, no, we need a campus. We need a whole secondary school, boarding school. Like a big school to service thousands and thousands of, of people in that area. And I was just, just thinking about that. And he said, we need a second school in the southern part of North Zambia. We need two schools. I said, uh, how, uh, <clears throat> how much would that cost? And he said, well, <clears throat> that would probably be, and he did some figures. And he said, we figured our need is about $1 million. I said, thank you for sharing with me <laughs> your need. <clears throat> Brother, it's good to meet you. And I said, I don't know what to tell you, uh, but God bless you and have a good night. And the pastor said, okay. And he walks out. I close the door. I get on my knees. And immediately God said, and that's the need you are supposed to go and address. I said, but God, you know what's in my pocket. Now remember, this is when I'm a paid pastor. So, of course, I'm a very wealthy man as a paid pastor back then. You know, not really, right? We're not really super wealthy as a paid pastor, but I, I had a salary then. And so I said, but God, how does this work? He said, I set this up for you. I, he said, I want you to see my glory and my power. Not my glory, his glory. Okay, I went to sleep. I could barely sleep that night. Oh, I was so excited, but also scared. How am I going to do this? By the way, unless if you in your life right now are reaching for something bigger than you, you're missing out to see the glory of God and what he raised you up to be right now in this end of time. If you're only reaching for things for Jesus that you can do, then you have the right to take the glory. But if you reach for something bigger than you, then you have only the right to give Jesus Christ the glory. Are you tracking with me? So I could barely sleep through that night. And that night... I went, and the rest of that day was amazing. I went back to my church, my not-rich church. Had a few people of money, but most people not. Many out of work, everything. And I went to my elders and to my church, and I said, God has shown me this in the night sky. And I told them about the key, and I said, what about building these schools? And the people said, are, are, you, are you looking at, are you, are you talking to us, Pastor? Uh, are you forgetting the church that you're pastoring? I said, no. I said, they said, how would we ever even touch that need here? We don't have that kind of money. How would we do that? Some of us are not even putting food on our table very well because we're out of work. How would we do that? And I said, can we get on our knees and ask Jesus if this is of him? 
And, they, and my elders and my church board got on their knees and they cried out to God, are you in this? This crazy story? Are you in this? Or is this just something that we're not having to be worried about? And as they got on their knees, the Spirit of God came and moved on the hearts of my elders. Every one of the elders of the church. And then he moved on the hearts of the church, their board. So much so that they got up from their knees and they said, you must take it to the church. And they took it to the church all together. A congregation a little bit smaller in attendance than here, but close. Similar, but a little, little smaller. And took it to them. And there was gasp, and people said, what? Us? I could see them whispering in the pews. Would you go on your knees and ask, is this the mission that God wants us to have? And they got on their knees, the whole congregation, and they cried out to God, God, why did you show our pastor that crazy wild need in a place we never get to go to in North Zambia? Why do you, wanna, why do you want us to do something about that? They prayed and cried out to God, and the Spirit of God came upon the congregation, and they stood up, and they voted with a secret ballot. And you know on that day, it was all unanimous except for two people. Unbelievable. Almost the whole congregation said, we will do this not by our power, but by the power of God. And people started doing what we heard about 2,000 years ago. People started downsizing. People started selling off an extra car here, an extra this here, maybe a bicycle. Children started selling toys and saying, Jesus... This isn't much, but it's what we have as kids. And they started selling for mission. Powerful. Powerful. And then as the money started coming up, it came up so, so slowly. A few hundred, a thousand U.S., two thousand. We were tempted to say, God, this is not, this is not working. Three thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand. And then one day, a family came up. And I'll never forget this. Pastor Don, we're out of work. We've been out of work for many months. My wife knows who I'm talking about. Precious family. They said, we are moved in our heart to sacrifice. We're talking about sacrifice tonight? And I thought, uh, 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 it, I was tempted to say, it's okay. It's okay. Never say that. The call to sacrifice is not just for wealthy people. Because all of us are wealthy with something. All of us in this room. My wife and I are wealthy compared with most of the world. You are wealthy compared with most of the world. Am I right? Those of you who come from, from Zimbabwe and different places, right? We are wealthy people no matter what we have tonight. We have so much. This family come up and say, come up and say we have very, very little. But we decided that every time our family, our children, we got on our knees. And we're struggling to pay our bills. We said, God, what can we do for this mission for the children of North Zambia. And the Spirit of God told our family that every time that we buy something, a grocery, and we get change back, we should take that change and offer it to the Lord Jesus for North Zambia. I said, you mean whatever? You put in a $20 bill and you have five bucks back? You put it in? They said, yes. Whatever comes back, you know, for change, that's what we put in. And they said, we've been doing that for months and months now. And here's our jar. Precious money. Almost, you could almost call it blood money. Doing without for mission. As the people of God started doing this, the poor in our church, they sacrificed maybe more than anybody else. Children giving up things that they love to play with. The, the Lord started bringing our church together around mission. And one year ago, we celebrated a school that was built and the first school was built already one year ago. 200 children are already meeting in it. But we did not come up with most of that money for that half of that million. As the Lord saw the little efforts we had in our church, God started moving other people outside of our church. It's not what we have, it's what He has. He wants us to give Him what we have. But then He'll multiply it many, many, many times He's waiting for his people to sacrifice. I don't know what God is getting ready to do in this church, Pastor. But there are mission projects that this church could do for the Lord Jesus that would make Satan not only pause, but be angry and terrified. 
There's potentials in this church with the wealth of this church. And money is the smallest thing that I see you have. Don't take it the wrong way. There's money. I know you have money. Everybody has money. But you have time. You have talent. You have experience. There's things that you know. Am I right? There's things you can do if you sacrificed it. God could do mighty, mighty things to reach this city right here and to reach this province this country, and even out to the countries you represent around the world. It could happen from here. It could happen with missions we don't even know yet, but that God knows for here. I invite you tonight, I invite you tonight to go out and stew on this, pray on this, because there is one more thing that can unite this church. But I hope and pray we do not wait for this factor. There is something that down through time has always united God's people and that is this thing right here. When persecution comes, it brings the church to its knees. But there will be some churches in the end of time that will go ahead of persecution and they will not wait for persecution. They will humble themselves and pray and break bread together and cry out to God and say, why did you call my church into existence? What's our mission? And in those churches, the Holy Spirit will be poured out lavishly. And when persecution comes, those churches will be leaders and servants to help other churches to know God is still alive. I invite you to stand with me. <clears throat> And I invite you to do a messy thing. Let's make a big, big circle tonight. A big circle around the whole room. Big circle. Uh, we may need to back up. Let's go on the other side of the camera if we can go so we can get everybody back there. Let's, let's get everybody in the circle. <clears throat> good, good, good. These two got to be together, amen? Okay. Praise the Lord. Are we all together? Now, turn to your right now, all the way around, and put your hand of blessing on the person in front of you. Okay, are we all connected? Look around and help me out. Are we all connected? Children too? Get every child that wants to be a part. And this lovely family right here, we're, we're, you're in, involved with our prayers too. Okay, are we ready? Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, as the Spirit of God has been asked for again and again to these 10 days, we ask right now in this room that your Holy Spirit would be poured out on that person in front of us. We lay our hands on their shoulders and we cry out to you, Father, pour out your spirit on that person as if it was the first time. Give them a fresh baptism of your Holy Spirit just because you love them. If our brother or sister in front of us is playing with sin, is compromising their faith, then God convict them of anything that's compromising Jesus and don't convict them to discourage them, but convict them to run to Jesus, who's the author and finisher of our faith. If the person in front of us has been too busy for you, too rushed with you, I pray you whisper to them to come away with you every day, to be in your word looking for Jesus and finding you, to come to you in prayer. If the person in front of us has a heartache, is burdened by something too big. May the Spirit of God lift it. Hmm. May you bring healing to the person in front of us that we're laying hands on right now. Healing where they need to have healing in their heart and in their soul, most of all. Heal them where you want to heal them. And God, pour out your Spirit on them to send them out. First of all, in this church, to start reaching out to portions of this church that they are not united with. But secondly, as they come together with other brothers and sisters in this church, make this a sending out church. 
all across this city. Amen? All across this province and across this nation and even to every country represented in this circle and more. Make it this way. You've trusted this church to be this kind of church. Your spirit stands ready. Now tomorrow, Lord, is our last time to meet in this series. It would be an easy thing for us to be anywhere but here. I cry out to you, Father, that as we pray on these things tonight, that your spirit would actually wake us up in the morning early enough to be with you, to review Acts 1 through 4 before we come at 930 and as we come together, I pray that there would even be more than 105, which we have tonight, which is amazing. I pray that you would help each one of us to say, who should I be inviting for tomorrow breakfast? And I pray that you would mobilize this church for the end of time by your spirit. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and keep you and have a good night. See you in the morning bright. Yes, and don't forget to bring toppings. Fruit, um, Jane, you want some? Oh, and we have cards. Do you have yes. cards to go? Okay. Here's a challenge card. Anything else that they need to bring, Jane? Juice, maybe? Juices, toppings, fruit, nut butters, whatever. We're going to make the pancakes. Okay. Um, syrups and things like that, too, maybe. Well, it's a topping. Butter, whipped cream, whatever. Whatever you find in your fridge, bring it. Okay, because there could be a lot of people. All right. God bless. We'll see you tomorrow. And tomorrow night, I mean tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, I have a surprise for you. Uh, each one that comes tomorrow morning, I will give you a copy by faith of my discipling book that you can use to go make a disciple of somebody else in this city for Jesus Christ. See you in the morning bright. 9.30 tomorrow morning.